What do you do once debt collectors start getting more aggressive? What are your options? Can you ever ignore them? Scott Terrio is here and we're going to discuss it starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. Scott Terrio, welcome back. We are here in our Toronto office. Uh, Young and King, I think this is the second podcast we have done in person since uh, March of 2020. Yeah, we, I think we recorded one a couple of months ago. There you here. go. So we're now we're now into the uh, it's it's now been almost three years since we were we were here on a the regular eight basis. King padded room, the eight king padded room, and so unfortunately our viewers can only see the shot we're taking. This this room is only about a foot longer than what it appears yeah, to be. Yeah, pretty much what you see is what you what get. You see, this we, is the room. Our, our, <laughs> chairs are, our chairs are bouncing up <laughs> against the uh, against the walls here. So if it's anybody, nice and hot. It's hot. So yeah. we're, even though this is the middle of winter and it's freezing cold outside as we record this, we're, uh, we are not wearing jackets today. So um, if anyone wants to tour the studio, you can come to 8 King Street East and uh, we'll, we'll give you the tour. And do a proposal while you're <laughs> That's here. That's right, while you're here. So what we've done is... We want to address this question, um, what, did, what to do when debt collectors get aggressive. And so, Scott, you've spent the last uh, couple of weeks thinking about this and jotting down a whole bunch of notes from, you know, real life cases that we've seen, what, what really happens. So we've got, we've got papers spread out everywhere, but let's, let's see if we can, yeah. we can give some insight into this. What can you do? What are your options? So we're going to make this as, as practical as we can. Yeah. So first question when do debt collectors typically start calling when should you expect it typically in normal times i would i would say you should expect calls from collectors if you've missed maybe one payment almost certainly two um, and that kind of that kind of flows with the prevailing economic times to a great extent because there are times when collection activity is just way higher mm-hmm. um you know, we happen to be seeing that right now, but um, it can it come it comes and goes, um, and and a lot of that is based on a whole bunch of moving parts and complicated factors that banks set up for themselves. Um, I used to know somebody who was the VP of risk at one of mm. the big five banks, um, and she was there a long time, and she did that job a long time, and uh, it was very math. Yeah, and that was because she that suited her, but she she was brilliant and. And she told me a lot about that stuff. And thankfully, I, she told me it after I started doing this job. So I really grilled her and, and I learned a lot about that. And so there are a lot of trigger mechanisms that banks have, depending on what's going on in the economic world. So if, you know, times are rougher on the banks, well, they turn the switch up and it's, she likened it to revving an engine. Uh, when they push the pedal down, when the risk VP pushes the pedal down, a whole bunch of things happen. So... Um, if you, you know, if, if it at one point it was three payments, you call somebody now it's two, or maybe it's one. Um, and that's based on banks, you know, wanting the money to come in instead of, you know, letting things go a bit. So well, yeah, a bank's job is to protect their shareholders. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine. We all understand what yeah. the game is. If you want to take part in the bank's profits, buy shares yeah. in the banks. So during good times, you know, 2018, 2019. It's like, yeah, you know what? If someone gets a couple of payments behind, we're not too worried about it because they'll probably be able to get caught up. Yeah. We are recording this early in 2023. Yeah. Um, I happen to believe we are already in a recession. Okay. The economists don't agree with me. But if you look at what the banks are doing. Yeah. And certainly you can look at the U.S. banks because they publish data more frequently. Yeah. They have increased their loan loss provisions. Yeah. What does that tell you? They see it coming as well. Yeah. So when they see problems coming, as you say, they rev the engine or you could call it putting on the brake in terms of new lending. Yeah. And so it used to be, well, in good times, maybe you get on your statement, it says, oh, you forgot your payment this yeah. month. You probably It's probably crossed in the mail. Don't worry about it. Yeah. If you've already sent this, your payment, please disregard this. The second... The second uh, statement is, well, we, we're going to freeze your account and, yeah. you know, by the third month they're calling you. What you're saying is as times get a little tighter, they yeah. start calling a little a little sooner. Yeah, much sooner in some cases. Um, and, and, and they try and be ahead of the curve. Banks are always trying to be ahead of the curve because they have their own economists and all that stuff. And so they try and foresee what's going to happen. They don't wait until, you know, all of a sudden their losses are huge. They know what's coming. Um and so there's levers they pull. And whether it's outside collection firms they are using or internal collections, they have both. They also have lawyers who are on retainer. 
Um, and we have a front row seat for this. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, anybody wondering, it's like when people call us, they have collectors on them. That's um, why whether they're it's calling CRA, us. private collectors, banks, uh, lawyers for that are on retainer with banks, all that stuff. So we get to see this right every day at work. Now, you made an interesting point there. Banks have internal and mm-hmm. external yeah. people. So in my experience, it's the internal people who start the calls. Yes. So if you're, let's say, a month behind or two months behind, the bank it's, will it's call an employee it. of yes. the bank. When you're a year behind, you're getting a call from a third party. Yeah, or sometimes agent. not even depending well, yeah, on how be, the bank be quicker has set than it that. up. Yeah. Yeah. So usually if it's two or three payments, you know, they have a mechanism that flips it to an external collection firm or their lawyers get involved at some point. And I mean, you know, this is this is a you know, this is a um, cost benefit analysis, right? So it depends how much you owe, depends how many payments you're behind. Because if you only owe 5000 to a big five bank and you're one payment behind, you're a way different risk profile than if you owe 50000 to that bank and you're three payments behind. And so that you'll usually get a lawyer's letter because it doesn't cost them much. Well, they charge the bank a lot, mm-hmm. but it doesn't cost nearly as much to do that than to take you through the full three-step sequence to go to court and sue you. Because we're talking about unsecured debts here. And with unsecured debts, they don't have anything on you. They They can't take your car. We tell clients the reason they're calling you is because they can't do much to you. Mm -hmm. So they they call you in lieu of going after you because going after you costs them money. I mean, at some point going after you makes sense because if they garnish your wages for 20%, they'll get paid eventually. It still takes a long time, but they got to pay that lawyer to do it. So this is the cost benefit that kind of goes on at the bank with the risk analysis. Yeah, and you alluded to something else there. It's not just, well, if you owe 50000 they're going to yeah. call you five times a day. But if you owe $40,000, they will only call you three times a day. Yeah. They're using, as you said, pretty fancy math here. Yeah, so I that, believe it's called an algorithm. Yeah, exactly. A fancy algorithm. Yeah. So the, the guy who owes $1,000, that might seem not like a big money, a big amount. Yeah. But they look at your credit profile and a bunch of other yeah, stuff. Yeah, there are, there are echelons and cohorts of that. Like, so a bank will do this to this many people. And then they'll do this to this mm-hmm. many people. And they'll do this to this many people. And so within those brackets you meet certain criteria. You've missed one payment or two payments. You owe this much or this much. You also owe somebody else uh-huh. and they can see that too. Yeah. And so some of the risk calculation here is, okay, if who's getting paid? Yep. Cause if he owes five banks, we know he owes five banks. We better get on. We want to be first. Right. So some of this yep. is them looking all over the place, not just their own statement. And I'm sure you've seen it many times as I have, we'll get two people come in to see us yep. here at Hoys Michaelis and associates. That's a good commercial. I just put in there. Right. Eh? And one, let's hold up the mugs. And one person owes fifty thousand dollars, and they haven't made a payment in three months. And there's a little note on their statement. And then the other person owes a thousand dollars, and they actually paid two hundred dollars last month. Yeah. And yet they're getting harassed by collection calls. Yeah. Some, you know, I'm talking about patterns, but sometimes there aren't any. Yeah. <laughs> and like, so oftentimes boy. there aren't. So, so, and that, but that shows you that different banks have different criteria. Yep. So one bank could be after the guy that owes almost nothing, and he's only missed one payment. The other guy owes eighty grand, and he's missed three payments, or he hasn't paid them in years. And, and at some point, if you haven't paid them in a very long time, they stop calling you because mm-hmm. they've written the debt off. Yep. That's the other thing that happens. That's, that's sort of the back end of this, right? Yeah. And that's where the whole algorithm thing comes in. It's not just the amount you owe. It's, it's all those other things. Yeah. And I think you would also agree that the, I don't want to, I don't know, the non-bank lenders, mm. let's call them that, the people who just provide credit cards and nothing else, or perhaps some of the the finance companies, they are much more aggressive with collections. You you miss a payment, yeah. you're a couple of days behind, and you're going to be hearing from them. Well, because, you know, from a capital capitalization standpoint, they're not as well capitalized as the big banks. So for them, you've got to be paying because their model is probably running right to the edge of, you know, mm-hmm. they don't have a lot of latitude that a, that a big wealthy uh, chartered well, bank. Well, and they're also them. lending riskier. Yeah. So they're used to it. They're used to it. Yeah. They're charging you 48% right. for a $10,000 loan. And yep. so therefore, you know what? You better pay. because. Yep. And the other thing is with those loans, uh, when you read page two that nobody reads, but we always read, it shows you what happens to you if you don't pay, right? And so things get expensive in a hurry. And so they have a lot more um, teeth, mm-hmm. I guess, because- we also see people who are doing what we'd call juggling payments. Mm-hmm. And so they owe 10 debts, 
try to pay 10 debts a month Can't is, do is, it. drives you insane. It also kills you financially. And so that's what brings them in. But if you're, if you're paying 1200 bucks a month in minimum payments to five or six or seven different credit cards, uh, you're probably paying a couple, but not the others. And then you're paying that the mm-hmm. ones you didn't pay next month. So then you're only ever 30 days behind. So you're kind of running, the, you know, the, a risk, a risk profile of yourself. So you're saying, well, I got to stagger these payments out because I can't pay 1200 a month. I can pay 600. Okay. Well, who gets the 600? Half them this month, half mm-hmm. them next month. And so we see that a lot too, where people kind of figure out, okay, here's what I can do to keep this at bay. Yeah, and if you're spending a few hours a month trying to juggle all your debt payments, then you might want to come in and chat with yeah, us. Yeah, it's we probably can, we can you're look probably at some other past options. Um, handling it yourself. Exactly. So I think you and I are both of the view that collection activity will continue to increase as we go through 2023, um, and you know perhaps into 2024. I don't know. And so as collections are ramping up, mm-hmm. let's talk about okay practical advice here then. Yeah. What should someone do as the debt collectors are ramping up their collection efforts? Like, what are the first steps that you should take? And maybe there's yeah. some things you shouldn't do as well. Yeah. Well, okay. So it's it's a good recommendation to to to, to speak with them, to communicate with them. They're not going to stop calling you if you ignore them. You can ignore them, and a lot of people do. Um, and you know, because it's an unsecured debt, if you are in a position where you cannot pay them you just can't, then there's not much point talking to them in that case because you can't pay them. So they're going to keep calling you, but you you can't give them something. If you're going to talk to them, you, you kind of have to throw them a bone. So you say, okay, look, it's Scott. I know you've been calling me all, you know, over a couple weeks now. Uh, here's my situation. Talk to them. Now, knowing that collectors have flow charts, mm-hmm. okay, on their screen that mm-hmm. you can't see. And so every answer that they can possibly think of that you could come up with, they have an answer for or a retort to. Um, so you kind of have to think ahead. If you're going to talk to them, you got to be a little bit prepared because they're going to ask you, well, this, this, why don't you pay this? Why don't you not pay your phone bill? Why don't you, you know, whatever. Don't pay your student loan or something. So be prepared ahead of time if you're going to speak to them. But the advantage of speaking to them is, you've actually fessed up and said, here's the situation. Maybe I can pay you something. Like, like tell me what I need to do to give you at, at least for now or or give them an amount that you can give them in a in a specified period of time. So, so that- there's a key point there. Give them an amount mm-hmm. you can pay. So yeah. if the, you know, I'm, my minimum payment was 500 bucks, I didn't make it. Well, obviously they want me to pay 500 bucks. Yeah. And I they're going to ask you for the whole thing. Right. The whole thing. So I don't have it. So what you're suggesting yeah. is you say to them, look, I, I don't have that, but what I could give you is a hundred bucks. Yeah. yeah. And they're not used to people answering and being voluntary yeah, with, with a plan. So this is actually quite an advantage or it can be, but, you, but again, you can't, you can't answer them and, and not be able to give them anything because mm-hmm. that they're not going to, that doesn't compute for them. So is there anything you shouldn't say we're going to talk about what you should say but is there anything you shouldn't say when uh when you're talking to a debt collector well uh you want to be a little bit cognizant of what's called the executions act um, of ontario which is the two-year statute for, uh, after which you can no longer be sued for a debt you, yeah that limi- still exists the limitations act limitations yeah. act yeah um so i you're, by answering the phone, you're kind of acknowledging, or they will take that as an acknowledgement of the debt anyway. So you really effectively kind of just said, okay, the two years starts now, as opposed to a year ago. Yeah. And that's, of course, a, a, a debate we could have with lawyers. The yeah. You're right. The debt collector will say, if you acknowledge the debt, then you yeah, acknowledge the debt. Right. Yeah. And clearly, if you acknowledge it in writing and say, yes, I owe this debt, right. and send them a registered letter, then yes, that would be an yeah. acknowledgement. I'd but even, if you do it verbally on a phone call, is that acknowledgement? Is that acknowledgement? They'll and, probably say it was. And but. clearly, making a payment would be an acknowledgement. Yes. So if you've got a debt that is you know, a year and a half old yeah. and it's closing in on the two year limitations period. Yeah. And we're talking about Ontario law here. It's similar in other provinces. Yeah. And what the limitations act says is if a debt has been in default for more than two years, the creditor can't sue you and get a judgment. I'm right. grossly oversimplifying it, but that's, right. that's the gist of it. They have to sue you quicker. Mm-hmm. So if you've got a debt that's almost two years old and the collector says, look, I need you to make a good faith payment of 10 bucks. Right. right. Well, when you make that ten dollar payment, you're now yeah. restarting the clock. Right. So we would sounds like a good deal. Yeah, we would not recommend that nope. in 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 that case. Yeah. I guess the other thing I would not be freely volunteering would be where I work. Right. 
because then you're telling them to call my employer. We get this a lot. Um, we get people who come in and maybe they're being called themselves. And then by the time we meet with them once, maybe twice, if it takes longer, usually it doesn't. But if it takes a month or so, they'll call back and say, well, now they're calling work. Mm -hmm. and so that's usually it. Like I got to I got to do something now. So, yes, you, you want to be careful about that because they uh, they have no compunctions about not no, calling they don't your care. employer. How would a collector find out where I work? Well, you tell them or they check your credit report. Yeah. Um, it'll be on there. That's a good one. Or they Google you yep. or go on LinkedIn. Like yep. there's Facebook. You, you know, it's very impossible to hide now um, in terms of the, of the web. Mm -hmm. And so I think collector's jobs have been made far easier by all these things in the last, you know, two yeah. decades. It's not hard to go on Facebook, LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, probably a good idea to be yeah. off Twitter then, I guess. It's probably, for, yeah. For, for, and, for, and I mean, you know, I, I should say that one good way to avoid creditors is to move abroad. Mm -hmm. I know this is yep. kind of off topic, but yep. most people who we file who are living elsewhere who have Canadian debts, and the reason they want to do a, I think they want to do a proposal of bankruptcy is because they might come back someday, and therefore they want to clear up their debts. I get that. But living abroad, you can do that. But there are no cross border treaties between even us and the U.S. on consumer debt. So no formalities. And so if you move to Buffalo, which is right over there, yep. Uh, you're and you'll stay there and don't move back to Canada. And I know this is not an option for everybody. I'm kind yep. of being facetious, but that's another way to get away from your creditors. Yep. Is just move somewhere else because they'll say, "Well, can't they come get me?" Well, yeah, but we're back to cost benefit now. Right? Yeah, sure. And they uh, and I have seen one of the big banks sue someone in California, but it was a significant amount of well, debt. Yeah, it has to be a lot of money, and you know, and they have trivial. to be working for like wages so right. that you can, it isn't complicated. They're not self-employed. They're not hiding money. Um, and yeah, it has to be enough. If you're going to hire Shalino and Barnes over in Buffalo yeah. to go after somebody, it's going to yeah. cost you some money it's, and therefore it's got to be worth it. Right. So, yeah. So I, I, it's a, it would be a, an unusual thing to do that. Unusual, so, yeah. so getting back to the employment thing, you're right. They know where you work by you telling them yep. or by yeah. when, when you filled out the credit application, if you've been at the same company for 10 years, everyone knows where you work yeah. or they do a credit check on you because every time you apply for credit, a new credit card or mm -hmm. an increase in your line, well, you fill it out. Here's where I work. Yeah. That gets reported yeah, to the credit Yeah, there's something bureau. somewhere. Right. So if you have just started a new job and none of your creditors are aware of where you're working and it's not reflected in your credit report yet, mm -hmm. then I would not be volunteering that information yeah. because you're right. All you're doing now is inviting phone calls to your work and yeah. potentially if they want to sue you and garnish your wages, they yeah. know where to send I actually it. had a guy one time who changed jobs. Because they were calling him at work. So he within the same industry, just a competing firm, I think his brother worked there or something. And he actually went to the mm -hmm. other firm just because he was sick of getting calls at work. Yep. And he didn't get a call for like a year yep. because they couldn't find him. And he was like, this is great. I'm doing the same thing. And, you know, I'm making the same money, but nobody's calling me at work. It's well, and we live in, in a world now where very few people are at the same job for 20 years. Yeah. It's highly unusual. I think the yeah. average tenure, or in fact, the average maximum tenure is probably like five years. In it other words, or less. Yeah. Yeah. If I yeah. was to survey everybody who's watching right age. now, yeah. yeah. If you, depending on the demographic you're looking at, yeah, it would be surprising yeah. if someone had been at uh, at a company for longer than that. Yeah. So you can kind of stay ahead of them. So okay, things not to say would be. Yes, I absolutely affirm that I owe this debt. I absolutely okay. Now, I don't know if that's legally binding or not, but yeah. I um, wouldn't. I wouldn't tell them you have a TFSA with fifteen thousand in mm -hmm. it. Yeah, D don't like, mention your don't, assets. Don't just close assets. Yeah, right. Ever because they're going to say we'll liquidate it. And yeah. and again, they don't care. So if you think it's unrealistic for them to ask you to do that, they will. Yep. Right. And so and, and we see that. And we even see that sometimes with proposals where. Sure. You know, a creditor voting on a proposal will say, well, what about this asset? But we disclose the asset. Yeah, so we, we disclose everything. And yeah. if you have a loan at Bank ABC and you have a TFSA at Bank ABC, they already know about it. No. So it doesn't, yeah. doesn't matter if you disclose it or not. It's, it's yeah, already it's, there. Yeah, but. you have to remember who you're dealing with here. They're going to look you up. And anything that's internal or in-house, they're going to see, right? Yeah. So you have to know that. Yeah, so I think when, when you get the call from the collector – you and you should anticipate this and that's really why we're doing this podcast today mm -hmm. if you have debt and you're behind what will you say when they call mm -hmm. and answer number one well it, it, telling the truth is the kind of the basic i would do that yeah because it's easier to keep your story straight if you just tell the truth yeah. that doesn't mean you have to tell your entire family story right it just means what you tell them is the just truth. tell them the pertinent thing the pertinent thing so yeah. um you know thanks for calling um i you know, I've, you know, I, I don't have the income to pay this debt. Yeah. 
which is probably the truth or else you would have paid it. Yeah. You know, um, I'm bringing in a couple of grand and my expenses are a couple of grand. Yeah, but here's what I do have. Yeah. But what what I can do is yeah. um, I I could give you 50 bucks every two weeks when yeah, I get Yeah, propose a plan. Make right? a plan. So in other words, make up your own proposal. In other words, right? say, okay, for the next six months, I can give you X dollars per month and then stop talking and see what they say. Keeping your mouth shut is always good. Yeah. So if I owe 10,000 bucks to this lender and I propose 50 bucks every two weeks, mm -hmm. what are they going to say? Maybe no. Yeah, maybe no. They're going to, well, they're going to try and get more out of you. So start low. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you can handle 200, offer them a hundred and then make it look like you're, you know, oh, okay, okay. I, you know, I can give you some more. But the other thing to consider here is that some collectors have bought the debt from the original creditor, right? So mm -hmm. if it's an outside firm, sometimes they buy the debt. So they're seeking to make money off this. So if they paid 10 cents, they want 20 cents. Well, maybe 20 cents will do it, yep. right? Maybe in that case, 20 cents, you're not going to know if they bought the debt, but you could try that and say, look, I can give you you know, 20% or whatever, work it out in your head over a number of months and how much you can handle per, in dollars per month. But that might do the trick yep. if it's a collector who's bought the debt and they're just looking to make yeah, some the, money off Yeah, the it. older the debt, the more willing they will be willing to make yeah. a deal. If you haven't missed a payment yet or you only missed your first payment, well, they want all their money and they want yeah. it now. Yeah. But if it's a year and a half old and it's now on a collection agency or even a debt buyer yeah. already, then yeah, you may well, be and, able and to propose a much smaller number. And you're also probably, you know, you're probably trying to get back somewhat current. You don't necessarily have to pay the whole 10,000. If you've missed three payments, you might be able to make a deal with them over two months to get you back to, mm -hmm. to current. You still have the 10,000 owing, but you're not delinquent by 2000 and then you get back into right? the regular so breaking stream into bite-sized pieces right yeah and that's a that's a better way to do it yeah. so um now we've we've talked about whether or not it's possible to deal with collectors on your own and i guess the answer is well yeah it is i i would i would address cra on this one uh, in addition to what we've said already on that so dealing with cra on your own CRA are not the scary monster people think that they are. Um, CRA have a lot of powers mm -hmm. and they can do a lot of things to you, but generally CRA are box tickers. Um, you know, they are accountants who sit in, in their cubicles, either in Ottawa or work from, working from home, and they, they follow procedures. Um, they're great rule followers. So what they want is to A, that you, they, they got you on the phone. Yay. Tick. Uh, you proposed some kind of arrangement to them. Tick. Uh, you know, we're getting something rather than nothing tick um, because we've seen like what, what makes me kind of crazy about CRA is all the things they can do, but they don't mm -hmm. like everybody who owns a house with equity, just lean their house. You know, if you owe them 10 grand now, it's going to take forever for them to sell the house and CRA will have to wait, but they're guaranteed to get paid someday. And they're the government. They're not going anywhere. But I think that my point is with CRA. You can talk to them and you can work out an arrangement because I've had lots of people who come to us and said, well, I'm already doing a payment plan with the CRA because what they'll do is they'll say, I have these five debts at the bank. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I, I say, well, do you have any tax debt? Oh, yeah, but I'm already paying that. And they don't realize they can put the tax debt in the proposal as well. So they're going to yep. stop paying that as well. But it point the point is they've made a deal with CRA because CRA will make deals with you. Yeah. Not always, well, but most of the time right. historically, it's a human on the other end, right? Yes. Historically, CRA is willing to make a deal over a year. Yeah, typically it's 12 months. 12 months. And so if you- Which is not bad. Yeah, I mean, it depends how much you owe and depends yeah. how much you've got. And if you're working as an employee now, well, it may be that when you file your taxes uh, in tax season, you're getting a refund. Mm -hmm. And maybe the reason you owe tax debt is because you cashed your RSP in two years ago. Yeah. And so maybe the problem becomes self-correcting over time. Yeah, so typically we have people who are in exactly the situation you just described, where they owe from 2018 to 2020, because during that period of time, I don't know, they cashed a bunch of RSPs or something. And so their income went up, so they got taxed twice when they when they, when they they took the money out and then as income later. Um, but now they, do, they haven't owed for two years. So they're kind of, their filings are current. They don't owe recently, but they owe from before. And of course, that's building with penalties and interest. So really, what, again, you're back to make it bite-sized, right? Say to CRA, look, I, okay, I owe you 10 grand from a five-year period six years ago. So let me give you over 12 months, you know, do the math in your head, and see what they say. They'll probably say yes because they just want to record that they've made a deal with you and move on to the next file. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So keep that in mind. If you can get it paid off over 12 months, particularly if you know you're getting a tax refund in the, the coming year, yeah. then they will be much more amenable to yeah, making a deal. Yeah, because you could owe CRA from years ago but still get a refund this year. 
Yeah, the, obviously possible. they won't. They won't send you the refund. I mean, they'll they, apply they it against they what you're. It to you, but they, yeah. it, they would be. It would become a credit on the account. Yeah. So you don't owe the ten. You owe eight or whatever, right? Yeah, so and that's really, a very common. So scenario. make sure you know what you're dealing with. In other words, is, yeah. is the is the advice. So I think for all creditors, the big picture is understand what you owe to everybody. Mm -hmm. There's no sense making a deal with one guy when you owe eight other guys. Yeah. Because if you're going to give all your money to that one guy, then you've just got seven other guys really cheesed at you and you're yeah. you're kind of you're kind of pooch. So uh talk to them, only commit to what you can actually do. Yeah. Don't keep a promise you can't keep. Yeah, don't don't make stuff up. <laughs> if you're going to answer the phone, have a plan and and make sure you know your numbers so that you can actually agree to something. So what if the numbers are just too daunting? So okay, I owe five different creditors yeah. $10,000 each, which is a very common scenario we see. Yeah. There's no way I can be giving each of them $1,000 a month or right. even $300 a month. Yeah. So at what point do you say, look, I got to make these calls stop. Yeah. At what point are you talking to someone like you or me? Yeah. Well, it, you're at the point where you can't pay them per month anymore um, because there's two definitions of insolvency. One is that you're, uh, at your, your liabilities exceed your assets. So that's your balance sheet. You're on paper you know, this minus this. Um, and the other one is you can't pay as they come due. And that's kind of the more frequent one is that, you know, because mm -hmm. that's the one that hits home, right? It's a cash flow that's issue. the one where the collectors are calling and you're juggling bills and you're going crazy and you can't sleep. So call a trustee. Um, trustees are licensed to give you advice that may or may not include filing a proposal. Uh, you know, we send a huge number of clients or not potential clients away because, you know, yeah, maybe we could have filed a proposal or a bankruptcy, but maybe they didn't need to because of this or this or this. Mm -hmm. That's typical for when you call us. So you're getting, you're getting very experienced professional advice for nothing. It doesn't cost anything. Um, which, people, which cheeses me off because the law says I can't charge anyone anything until they actually file their yeah. proposal. So you're right. We end up in far more than half of the cases of people who call yeah. us. Oh, yeah. We, we don't charge anything. I've met with people over the course of two years, eight or nine meetings, and they never filed. Yeah. But I gave them damn good advice yep. over that time, and they ended up fine, but didn't didn't get a cent. And I'm not really upset about it because all of those people end up sending us their friends and yeah, other people, and it, it all works. But that's a, a good indication of whether you're dealing with someone reputable or not. Yeah. Because if they're charging you an upfront fee, mm -hmm. they're not reputable. Right. I mean, I guess if they're a chartered accountant or a lawyer, then I, could, I would yeah. withdraw that. But if they are a, a debt consultant, yeah. not a licensed insolvency yeah. trustee, you got to give them a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks before something yeah. happens. Yeah. Then, yeah. then clearly you're dealing with someone unreputable because yes. it's against the law for us to do it. So, so really, the big kicker for you then is cash flow. If you yeah. are at the point Always. where I cannot cover my debts on yep. a monthly basis, then I got to look to other Yeah, options. very rare is the situation where someone calls us and they are paying 2000 a month comfortably, but they owe so much that it'll never get paid. That's not typical. Typically, it's they can't make the payments anymore or, or they're doing the juggling thing, which I mentioned before. They're paying mm -hmm. some this month, some next month, or they're not paying anybody. Um, it does happen that someone says, yeah, I'm paying 2100 a month of my 10 credit cards and I owe, but the reason I'm in your office is because I'm never going to pay the 150 grand. Mm -hmm. never. I just, I've come to the realization, I'm just, this is stupid. Why am I doing this? 1500 of the 2000 a month I'm paying is interest. It's dumb. So that happens, but it's much, it's much more rare. Yeah. The typical scenario is when I add up all my minimum payments, it's $2,000 a yeah. month. Or usually when we add them up, yeah. it's way higher than they That's thought. That's right. They yeah, thought yeah. it was 1200 It's 1500 right. That, yeah. that happens every day. All the time. Yeah. And it's because I'm taking from here to pay there. They also are surprised by the total debt. Always. Mm -hmm. it's, they think it's 26000 It's thirty two. Yeah. That's That happens every it's day. It's almost all and the time. And that's the, that's the whole defense mechanism, the psychology of this, right? Is that, you know, you're just, you're not dealing with it entirely. You're dealing with it partially. And so you, part of the protection for your psyche is that, well, I don't really want to know that I owe 32000 or that I'm paying 1500 a month. Yeah. 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 So what is your closing comment then? What is your closing advice? What, you know, when the debt collectors are calling, what is the advice that you give to people? Well, if, if you can, you pay what's urgent. Um, if you have to juggle, juggle. So if you have six debts, pay three and pay the other three next month. You're not going to be able to sustain this without a, a significant income difference. And that typically doesn't happen. Um, you can meet it head on and talk to them and try and make arrangements with them, or you can make a deal with some of them. 
So if you owe six, maybe you answer three phone calls and see see what you can do. So you can do a kind of a partial solution. Um, or you can talk to a trustee and say, look, I may need to file bankruptcy or proposal or not. I don't know. And mm-hmm. we'll tell you. Yep. I mean, as you said before, like over half the people that call us don't end up filing because we sit down and go, okay, what's the whole thing here, right? Because if we don't do that, at some point, our name is mud. That's and right. So we're not going to do that. So we're going to give you honest advice because that's the business. But at some point, you have to realize that you're 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 either going to do something about it via an insolvency proceeding or a, a deal that you can actually make, which is hard to do, or you're or you're going to spend ten years or fifteen years paying that debt yeah. off. So some people don't like the time frame, right? If you're in your twenties, maybe you can spend ten years paying it off. If you're in your forties, you can't or fifties because you're just you're too close to retirement. You're too close to your income dropping substantially enough that you'll never pay the debts off. Yep. Yeah. And so whenever anyone contacts us, we always ask them to, you know, give us every statement you've got. So we know how much you yeah. owe to everybody. Yeah. And then what is the minimum payment each month? Yeah. And then, okay, how much comes in? How much is your paycheck? How much yeah. do you pay for rent and groceries and everything else? And when you actually write the numbers down, it usually becomes pretty obvious. Yeah, I can't do this. Yeah. We're like doctors in a way. Like I was thinking about this last night when I was on a video call with somebody, you know, cause I'm sitting there. So there's, there was three of us. There was the person, there was their trusted advisor and me. So there's like the Hollywood squares thing mm-hmm. on the screen. So, so I'm watching myself in a way. I'm making notes. And then the advisors who's kind of sitting in the back, right? So she has a good view of what's going on. She's like, she's like, you're like a kind of a almost a cyborg. You're just writing the facts down and you're right. That's because that's all we're doing. Mm-hmm. We're saying you owe this much, like you actually owe this much, because we'll we know how to ask. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, and here's how much you bring in. And oh, maybe your work is seasonal. So you, you know, four months of the year you make a little bit less, but you make a lot for the rest. So maybe we structure something when we get all the facts down on paper and we've done so many of these that we can tell you within 20 minutes Pretty quickly. exactly what the what what your best of a bunch of bad options is because yep. that's often what it is but it's still good yep and that's why our tagline at Hoys Michael is, is give us 30 minutes and we'll help you well cuz in 30 minutes we can yeah. in most cases I can underst- get a lot done oh, in 30 yeah. minutes understand your situation and yeah. then provide you with yeah. the options and a lot of the time what we say is well here's the math cuz all cuz all we do is ask the exact number of questions we need to yep. that's it I don't want to know that your sister is in camp. I don't want to know that, like, this is all down to nuts and bolts now. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, you still do it in a, in a way that's social and compassionate, but, but, but really we're solving a problem. Yeah. And because we're outside, I can look at it completely dispassionately. Yep. And within 30 minutes, I can tell you, well, if you do this, you're going to fix this. There you go. So the answer to the question, what do you do when debt collectors get aggressive? Well, try to make a deal with them. Yeah. Don't promise what you can't do. Mm-hmm. Crunch the numbers beforehand so you know be what to prepared. say to them. Be prepared. I yeah. think that's that's yeah, key. If you're going to answer the phone, you better be ready. Yeah, have a plan. Because they're going to be ready. Yeah. Right? They have their they have their flow charts in front of them. They do this every day. And, and they, when, know the, they know the buttons to push. Exactly. And when you crunch the numbers, if the math just doesn't work, well, then you want to talk to a licensed insolvency trustee who can show yeah. you the And remember that these are unsecured debts. So if you ignore them, until they go to court, they can't garnish your wages. They can't. So if you're not banking with a bank you owe money to and therefore risk the bank taking money out of the account to offset the debt you haven't paid, um, then you're okay for a bit. For a bit. Not for super long, but because mm-hmm. it depends on, like I said, the prevailing economic situation, what the risk VP at the bank has said. Um, you know, Maybe they'll come after you sooner. But unless they sue you in a three-step process in court, they can't actually get money from you, which is why they're calling you. Yeah. And so they're calling you probably because you have debt. Yeah. So you got to deal with the yeah. underlying so, problem. So, so they they aren't suing you yet, but they're going to at some point and you need to know that. But for now, you know, the reason they're calling me is because they either can't sue me or they haven't done it yet. Yeah. Better to be ahead of the it's curve. The cost benefit's not there yet for exactly. them. Exactly. Scott, thank you very much for being here. That you. is how you to deal with debt collectors when they get aggressive. Have a plan. Jump on it early because debt is not going to go away on its own in most cases. That is our show for today. I will put links to anything we've mentioned in the show notes on YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, click all those different buttons because it, I don't know, makes the algorithm think, uh, I don't know, just click all the buttons. You know how to do it. Click all the buttons. If you're listening to the audio version of this, please subscribe and like. We have a new version of the podcast, a new episode every Saturday morning. That is our show for today. Until next week, thanks for listening. I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30 or 34, but we were pretty close. So 
Yeah, we could have done three hours on that. Pretty yeah, easily. I know. I, I could have. Um, there's probably another. There's probably a podcast well, in and how banks work uh, in terms of what. Well, they, maybe we should suggest that to Miriam and then and then do that. So yeah, because I, I I mean I made a 